Thanks, Brother Michael. Well, brothers and sisters, we're going to talk about resurrection uh, this morning. And I'd like you to join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you would, because we didn't quite get to deal with the uh, final couple of verses in that chapter. And we very quickly, by the way, went through verse 16. I did it mu much more thoroughly this morning with the teenagers. So we want to just have a quick look at verse 17 and 18 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where Paul says, having spoken about the dead in Christ rising first, having reminded us of the judgment in the voice of the archangel, having suggested that the resurrection will occur on the day of atonement, all of those things were in verse 16, he now says, then we which are alive and remain, or left over as that Greek word means, shall be not caught up, but caught away. This Greek word harpezo, you're going to see again in a moment, it means to snatch, to seize, to take hold of forcibly as a wild beast takes its prey. In other words, it's telling us, brothers and sisters, that when the angels turn up at our door, and that's what's going to happen. We, we hear ridiculous things about you know, people driving down the street in a motor vehicle and they're ripped out and the car careens down. That's all rubbish. We know how it's going to happen. We're told it in Luke 17. Remember Lot's wife, I tell you, in that night. He's been talking about day and days. In the, no reference to night except when he says, I tell you, in that night. And what he means is, go back and have a look what happened in Genesis 19. The angels turned up at the time when you can most expect the male to be home from work. They wouldn't have come when Lot was sitting at the gate arguing with the elders of Sodom. It came when he was home at night, when the family could be expected to be together. And by morning they were gone. Okay? That's what we're being told. So when, we, when those angels come, there's no good saying to them like the parable suggests in Matthew 25. Now listen, could you give me another couple of weeks? I'd just like to get my act together. No. You are going to the judgment seat of Christ. That's what he means here. We caught away together with them, not in the clouds, there's no definite article in the Greek, in clouds, the symbol of a multitude, Hebrews 12 verse 1, Ezekiel 38 verse 9 and verse 16, and other references that tell us that the cloud is the symbol and the word of God for a multitude of people, caught away together with them in clouds to meet this word meet is also significant. It's the Greek word that was used when you were being approached by some delegation of importance and you went out to meet them. You know, if some Roman delegation was coming from Caesar, you wouldn't go out and sort of say, well, what are you doing here? You would go out and you'd have, you'd say, yes, sir, we'd like to invite you in, sir. And that's exactly what it will be, brothers and sisters. We're going to meet the greatest dignitary apart from one, in the universe. The one who's going to be called the father of the age. The one who's called Michael the Archangel in Daniel 12 verse 1 with delegated authority from God to determine destinies. Yes. She'll meet the Lord, not in the air. There's no article there either. That's why you've got a red line through it. You can cross it out safely. In air. This is the aerial, the governing region. Paul talks in Ephesians 2 verse 2 about the prince of the power of the air. And then in chapter 6 of Ephesians verse 12, he tells us who it is. He says, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against those who control the air, the, the, the princes of this age. He's talking about governments. You see, the whole point of the resurrection, as we saw yesterday, is that Christ is coming to put together an army that he might establish a new <laughs> Aerial, a new government for our world. That's the purpose of the return of Christ to raise the dead and to gather those who are alive and remain. And so he says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. So when the angels do turn up, what method of transfer might we expect? Well, we're going to see in a moment. But these are the this is the this is the symbology, this is the figures of speech that the apostle is using. He talks about meeting the Lord in the aerial. Well, how is this going to come about? Well, the sun of righteousness of Malachi 4 verse 2, beaming today down upon the sea of nations that are casting up mire and dirt, 
Here and there evaporates one of those little droplets and they go up and form clouds of witnesses. And their first work will be to drop the storm, the hailstorm, upon this world of Revelation 16 and verse 21. You come down like hailstones. But when that work is done, Psalm 72 verse 6, that they shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, mown down by the hailstones. So you just see the, the, the language that Paul is weaving into this? And what's the purpose of it? Well, to establish this new government. Now this is what we've been reading about in 1 Thessalonians 4. This is a summary of what Paul said. The living saints will not precede the dead. Christ will return with a shout or a command that will awaken the dead. He will come with the authority of the archangel to forgive or condemn, to invite in participation or to banish. The dead having been raised, he will gather the living with them into a place of judgment and he will grant a reward to the faithful. Rulership in the kingdom at his side. So shall we ever be with the Lord, says the apostle. And it's all about to happen, isn't it? All about to happen because this is the purpose, to establish the new aerial. This is the hierarchy of the kingdom age. Yahweh's always going to be at the pinnacle of that, of course, but he has delegated to Christ all power in heaven and in earth. That's why Christ is called in, in Isaiah 9 verse 6, the father of the age. It's like he's the God, the father is on earth in the person of Jesus Christ. The Father. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that when the thousand years is up, he gives the kingdom back to God. He's got that massive authority to rule for God on earth, but he won't be doing it alone because he will have with him his immortalized brethren and they will rule with him as lords and kings. He's king of kings and lord of lords. They're kings and lords. They're king priests. And the angels will be a delighted audience. That's why they're off to the side there. That's what Brother Roberts calls them, a delighted audience, because they will be watching for a thousand years the results of 6,000 years of work. And they will take great delight in that, just like we older brethren take great delight in seeing younger brethren coming up and taking over our role. So we don't have to stand up here anymore. Don't we, Brother Dev? Yes. So the angels will stand back and delight in what they have accomplished over that 6,000 year period of human probation. Paul says in Hebrews 2 verse 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. And the word in the Greek there for world is oikomene. And oikomene means the inhabited world. Normally when it's used in the New Testament, it refers to the Roman world. Obviously here it's talking about the inhabited world of the kingdom age. So the angels will be, will be off to the side, but not, of course, eliminated. There is a delighted audience. And we have a mortality line. Whoops. We have a mortality line. Beneath that mortality line, you've got the restored tribes of Israel as the head of the nations and the mortal populations of the nations. But there's another group there which we're going to talk about at the end of the week. They're not listed on that chart. They sit actually here. It's the young children of Christadelphian parents who were too young to be held responsible at the judgment seat of Christ who are going to be in the land promised to Abraham and have one of the greatest privileges that could ever be given to a Christadelphian young person. We'll come, at, we'll come to that, God willing, at the end of our studies this week. So how do we get there? Well, here are some, uh, some examples of mortal transfer. Now, for the sake of time, you want to go to Acts 8, I'm, I'm happy with that, but I'm not going to go there because I need the time. In Acts chapter 8, verses 39 and 40, Philip's been preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. And he baptises him, and all of a sudden, Philip disappears. Now, he's down in the Negev. He's gone down here into the Negev. He's somewhere down beyond the, the Gaza Strip area. Okay? And then all of a sudden, he's gone. And the record says he's caught away. Harpazo. This is the word used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17 of our removal to the judgment seat of Christ. All right? Caught away. Now, if you'd asked Philip, 
Did you enjoy the coastline as you were passing over Ashkelon? It was a nice beach at Ashkelon, we'd just been there. Did you enjoy it? He would have said, what are you talking about? I never saw any coastline. And neither did he see a coastline. Any more than Enoch or Elijah, who were translated, saw where they were being removed to and saw what was between. Picked up, dropped. That's what happened to Philip. That's what happened to Enoch. That's what happened to Elijah. And it's going to happen to you and me. And it happened to the apostles as well. So here is Philip, transported 25 miles in American terms, 32 kilometres in Canadian and Australian terms, to Ashdod. Okay? Well, have a look in your own time at John chapter 6. Again, I'm not going to take you there for the sake of time, but in John 6, verses 16 to 21, we have the record of the storm on the lake, and there are the disciples rowing against this violent storm, and Christ comes. And eventually he gets into the boat and there's, a, and there's a calm. You know what it says? It says, immediately they were at the land whither they went, to Capernaum. So they're out in the middle of Galilee and it can get rough there in a storm. I can tell you that. It gets very rough in a storm. But you see, here you've got a 25-foot long boat with 13 men in it and it's out in the middle of the lake at this moment, and it's in the port of Capernaum the next. Huh? The same way, brothers and sisters, that the angels, who always behold the face of my Father in heaven, Matthew 18, verse 10, can also perform Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of Yahweh encampeth around those who love him. So they're here, Somewhere around this area, there are many angels at this moment. They're resting. They don't need a cup of coffee, but they're resting. When you go to bed at night, they're not needed anymore, and they need to write up your record. So where do they go? They go back to the Father. Well, where does he live? In the heaven of heavens. Well, where's that? Somewhere in the middle of the universe? We don't know. But we know this, that the closest star to Earth is four light years away, which means if you travel at 186,000 miles per second for four years, you reach the first star. Yeah, see the point of this? They can be with the Father one moment and with us the next. That is spirit travel. It is vastly different than human travel. Ask those who drove up from Los Angeles to come to the Bible school. It's very, very different to human travel. And we're about to be subjected to it. You're not going to see, in our case, when the angel comes, if I happen to be home with my lovely wife and the angels knock on our door, you're not going to see the Indonesian archipelago as you pass over. One moment, you'll be at 4 Patman Road, and the next moment, before Mount Horeb. That's how it's going to happen. And we've got clear scriptural evidence of that. I want you to come to 1 Peter chapter 4. Here we have Peter's amazing description of responsibility to judgment. A question, of course, which is bandied around, has been for a long time. So, so simple. And I've done this talk in places where there are people in the audience who are going like this. No. You know, so I know what it's like. But this is so simple. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? of God. For if the righteous scarcely be saved, and by that he means, of course, that none of us are going to be given immortality without forgiveness. We're all going to need forgiveness. Hopefully that will have happened before we get to the judgment seat, but we're going to have to have divine grace. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where, he says, shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So why does he use these terms, righteous, ungodly and sinner? Judgment begins, he says, at the house of God. We're the first cab off the rank when it comes to judgment. 
and it won't be very long. See, when the Father looks down upon humanity, brothers and sisters, he he only sees two general classes of humanity. He sees saints, that is, those who have a covenant relationship with him, and sinners, those who don't. That's as simple as it is. Now, of course, the sinner class is far outweighs the saint class in terms of numbers. But, sadly, within the saints group, there are two other groups, two division, a, a division. You have the righteous saints and you have ungodly. That's why the term ungodly is used, you see. Because these people, if they're saints, should be godly. But unfortunately, they're they're ungodly. So, when he comes to turn to the other side of this equation, you've got the sinners here on the right-hand side. Now amongst them there are enlightened sinners like the man in the parable of Matthew 22 who comes to the wedding feast without a wedding garment. Now in those days you couldn't get through the door. They had a narrow door. And they had a man standing there with a pile of wedding garments over his arm. So this guy pushes past and says, I'm not wearing one of them. I grew up in the truth. I I know the truth. But I ain't going to submit to baptism. That's not for me. He's only asked one question, isn't he? Friend. He could have been a friend, couldn't he? Friend. How camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And the, and the Greek word for negation then, not, is the word that indicates that he knew he didn't have a wedding garment. Ask me about that later. We don't have time to do that now. He knew full well he didn't have a wedding garment. It was deliberate. Only one question asked. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you see, on the saint's side, we are going to be held responsible. We have a covenant relationship if you're baptised and you're responsible for outcomes. So you're going to be interviewed. We'll talk about this in, in, in our next studies, God willing. We're going to be interviewed by the angel to see whether or not we have been responsible in the way that we have treated the deposit that was given to us in the truth. That's responsibility. But on the other side of this equation, the enlightened sinners are going to be held accountable. You'll say, well, uh, that's semantics. No, it's not semantics. You see, responsibility is where you expect people to produce outcomes. If I give my son $10, I expect him to come home with something that's worthwhile for $10. I'm going to ask him about it. But you see, if you refuse to accept the $10 then I'm not going to ask you what you did with it. I'm only going to ask you one question. You idiot. Why didn't you accept the $10? That's the only question you're going to be asked. Got the point of this? So there's responsibility and there's accountability. So here we have the three groups who will be at the judgment seat of Christ. The unenlightened sinners, of course, they're the class he talks about And he says, uh, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? He means this class here. But in verse 17 he said, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? That incorporates all humanity who have good reason, Romans chapter 1 says, to know that there is a God. And they should pursue that God, if happily they might seek after him and find him. So when the judgments come, they're guilty. Simple as that. So here are your classes, brothers and sisters, who will be at the judgment seat of Christ. The bulk of humanity, of course, not accountable. In ignorance, the vast majority of mankind fits into that class, but they will receive just judgment when those judgments fall in Armageddon and beyond. Got a picture? I haven't quite finished yet. I want to read verse 19. It says this, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God and Peter is writing to a class of people who were subject to the most horrendous persecutions. This was the, this was the Nero era. This was the, the time when he would put Christians, as to use that term, on posts in his backyard while, and he would have dipped them in tar and lit them up so they were torches in his backyard while he practiced his charioteering. This was the time when people were tied up in, in new animal skins 
and thrown to the lions and other wild animals who tore them to shreds and ate them. So our brethren ended up as a handful of animal dung or a pile of ash. He's writing to those sort of people. And he says this, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now if I was writing this, I wouldn't have used those words. I would have said unto a faithful God, a loving heavenly father. True? Why does he say unto a faithful creator? Well, because resurrection is a recreation, that's why. And this word anastasis, which some uh, say variously is anastasis, have it your way. Uh, this word anastasis means a rising up, a standing up from the root anastemi. To stand up, to cause, to rise is used 42 times in the New Testament. 39 of those, it's rendered resurrection, once rising again and once raised to life again and once that should rise. So you know, it's pretty obvious what it stands for, isn't it? The resurrection is clearly the standing up of dead ones. And it will be the virtual recreation of former beings into exactly the same mental, moral and physical state that they possessed prior to their death, minus whatever it might have been that brought them there. You know, if they were in a car accident and mangled to pieces, whatever, that'll be gone, but you will see them and you will know them. And I'm looking forward to it, brothers and sisters, like you are. And there's some special reasons in my life why I'm looking forward to it. I visit cemeteries pretty regularly the day after the Day of Atonement, which I believe will be the day of the resurrection. And I go there in the hope, it's been vain so far, in the hope that I will see disturbed ground. There was evidence of the resurrection of Christ, wasn't there? There was an open tomb. The stone had been rolled away. Yeah. There was clear evidence. I think there will be evidence at the graves of those who ended up being buried. We've lost some people. Tragically lost some people. Like the family that fell out of the sky over the Pacific on the way to, the, to Lord Howe Island. Their bodies were never found. They were eaten by fish. They weren't put in a grave. But many are, including my mother and including two of my best friends. I was 18 years of age. Within two days of getting into a motor vehicle to go to Perth to a youth conference. Two of my very good friends, Phil King and Ian Robinson, 19 and 18 years old respectively, we're off to Bible school at Rathmines, 900 miles away. In the week prior, they had been painting charts. There was no such thing as PowerPoint in those days. We didn't even have those ancient things you call overhead projectors. They didn't exist. You wanted to put something up in front of people, you had to paint charts, like Murray Stewart used to do. And they had been painting charts to one, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning all that week. Then they left on a Friday to drive through the night to go to a Bible school 900 miles away. And as the morning sun arose, the driver, Phil, fell asleep. The old Holden vehicle, the FX Holden they were driving, slammed into a eucalyptus tree that makes these pine trees or fir trees, whatever they are here, look like toothpicks. The two in the front were killed instantly. But there was a young chap, not baptised, lying on the back seat of this motor vehicle. And they didn't have seat belts in those days. And he slammed into the front seat of the car on the impact was seriously injured. This car was found by another vehicle full of Christadelphian young fellows It was following them. That young chap was baptised shortly thereafter. His name is Grant Jolly. A wonderful brother. 
I will never, ever forget standing beside that grave. And on the other side of it was Brother Jeff Berry, who'd kept these boys up to two o'clock in the morning that week. Imagine how he felt. 19 and 18. And I often ask myself, why? Why did I have the opportunity to marry a lovely young sister, to have four children and 12 grandchildren and go to Bible schools all over the world, to have this wonderful family that we had? Why? Why me and why not Phil and Ian? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe they were ready and maybe I wasn't. I'm going to see him soon. And so are you. That's why this is so important, brothers and sisters. There were Corinthians who didn't believe in the resurrection. But we do. I want you to come to 1 Corinthians 15. Those of you who have read Christadelphian writings on 1 Corinthians 15 will know that there are differences of view, of interpretation of this chapter amongst really senior brethren of the past. For example, Brother Roberts didn't agree with Brother Thomas. Brother Carter didn't agree with either Brother Thomas or Brother Roberts. And they're, pretty, they're pretty big names, aren't they? So who am I? Who am I to suggest to you that I've got the answer? Well, I'm nobody. But you know who had it right? Brother Thomas. And I want to show you why. So these are the three views. And I'm, we're referring here to verse 30, uh, 35 through 37 of 1 Corinthians 15. It's all about sown. Three views on sown in 1 Corinthians 15. There's the view that we are sown when we are born into a state and an environment related to corruption, dishonour, weakness and to things natural. That was Brother Robert's view. There's the view that we are sown when the dead body is buried in the ground. And there's the view that we are sown when we are called forth from the grave at the resurrection. Now, I could give you a test that will make Steve Purcell's word test at the back there look like Sunday school stuff. All right? So which of these views are right, you reckon? Well, I saw one sister put three fingers up. Now, that's, that's sort of having, a, a, you know, as they say, a bet two ways, isn't it? Sort of, well, three ways. <laughs> well, actually, the, the two and three are correct. Two and three are correct. Now, I want to show you why. Have I got you sort of a little bit interested here? Good. So let's press on. Verse 35, Paul says this to the unbelieving class in Corinth. He says, but some man will say, and he's actually putting words in their mouth. Because so, he knew this is what they would say. How are the dead raised up? Well, what's this word raised here? Well, it means, it's a gyro. It means to rebuild, to cause to exist. It's not actually about the resurrection of the body. It's about where it ends up. The rebuilt. Where are you going to end up? That's the question. Proof? What follows? Context is critical in biblical exegesis, brothers and sisters. Never, and you're going to see this lesson here this morning, never ever press the meaning of a, of a Greek word from a so-called lexicon against a context. Never. All right? Very, very important. Mind you, we're going to see that the Greek words used here are correctly used by Brother Thomas and not widely understood in our community, by the way. So this word agyro is going to play an important part. Proof and with, or as Brother Thomas translates it correctly, to or for what body do they come? So the question is from these unbelievers in Corinth, oh Paul, resurrection's rubbish. How can you take a pile of ash 
or dust and, and recreate the being that existed before. That's rubbish. And anyway, where does this end up? That's their question. Where does it end up? Well, Paul's going to give them an answer. Thou fool. And he means, he means empty head. Ignorant. That which thou sowest is not quickened or given life, except it die. It's a very simple principle, isn't it? Except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it cannot live. It's simple. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not in that body that shall be, but bare or naked grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, or as that could be better rendered, according to his will. So what is his will? Well, it was expressed in Genesis 1 verse 11, that every seed would bring forth fruit after its kind. So if you, if you planted wheat, you didn't expect to go out in four or five months and harvest barley, did you? you you're going to get wheat if that's what you planted. And the point that Paul's making is this. That if you put someone who's mortal, who's died, into the ground, like you put seed into the ground, what do you expect to get out? An immortal? Like some people believe? The Aeoni and Zoe believers? No. You get out a mortal body, because that's what you put in. The nature of the body, when it comes out, is the nature that you put in. On the principle of Genesis 1 verse 11. That's what Paul's talking about. So what's this word sowest here? It's the word spiro. Spiro. S-P-E-I-R-O. And it happens to be in the active voice. Very important fact. Not often observed. It's in the active voice. And it means to scatter seed or to sow seed. Now read it again. Verse 37. And that which thou sowest, get the idea? The sower went forth to sow. Yeah, that's what that word means in that context. This word occurs three times in verses 36 and 37, all in the active voice. And Liddell and Scott's Greek lexicon will tell you that in the active voice it means to scatter seed or to sow seed. Got that one? Now I'm going to jump over in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to jump over... Uh, verses 39 to 41, because they're actually a little parenthesis in the record. I'm going to come down to verse 42, because there we meet another word. But let's just clearly establish in our minds what this is about. This is about the sower going forth to sow. It represents the burial of the dead body. And when a farmer wants to plant seed, he ploughs the field, he digs it up, puts the seed in, and then he covers it over. When you bury someone that's dead, what do you do? Ask Brother Paul, he does this all day. All right? He digs a hole in the ground. True, Paul? And you put a body in there, usually in a box. And what do you do then? You get the tractor and you push the dirt over. Simple, isn't it? That's what that word means. That's what Paul's talking about in verse 37. Naked grain, he says. Naked I came forth, says Paul. And naked I shall return. Let's come to verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now notice that. What's the subject matter of verse 42 onwards? Burial or resurrection? You make the judgment. The word resurrection there you're going to see in a moment is anastasis, which means the standing up of dead ones. Got the context? Right. This word spiro in the Greek occurs four times in verses 42 to 44, but it's in the passive voice, where it speaks of the results of sowing, not the act of sowing, but what you get out of sowing. The word in the Greek is actually, and this is its form, spirito. You see, it has a suffix. Passive voice, it means to spring or be born. Liddell and Scott, Greek lexicon. Now, is this correct? Context is your final arbiter. What's your context of verse 42? 
so also is the standing up of the dead ones. This is not about burial. This is about people popping out of the ground. Okay? That's your context. Then it says this. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. What on earth is Paul talking about? He's talking about the resurrection of the body. And what's this word here? Sown. Well, we've seen it. It's this word sporito. To spring or to be born is the meaning of that word in the passive voice. Someone needs to be put in the ground, obviously. <coughs> oh, that's awful, isn't it? <laughs> it says, sown in dishonour, raised in glory, four times. What's this word? Well, it's a gyro, but it's also got a suffix. It means to raise up, to rebuild, to cause to exist. So it's not talking about resurrection. It's talking about where you get at the end of the process. It's about glorification of the body. So here is the, here's the pattern of contrast that Paul's making. Bearing in mind that we've got to interpret this word as it springs forth, because that's the context. That raised means it's caused to exist. Paul is saying... That when the body is brought forth from the grave, it comes out mortal. Therefore, it, is, it springs forth in a state of corruption, mortality. But by the time that the judgment process is finished and Christ turns to those on the right hand and changes their nature, you've got an end product. It's caused to exist in a state of incorruption. It springs forth in a state of dishonour. End of process, glory. Springs forth in weakness. We're going to see in Daniel if I've got time to do it. Ends in power. Springs forth a natural body created by immortality into a spiritual body. Got the point of that? So guess, guess where you find all that? Anastasis. <laughs> 1866. Dismissed by some people. Because Brother Thomas does make one mistake in anastasis. And his mistake is to misuse Genesis 2 verse 7, which is quoted in verse 45, to say that the resurrected body comes forth in the state of Adam's body before the fall. Wrong. But guess what? Wise Bible students who have things pointed out to them will go and look again. And within two years, when he wrote Eureka Volume 3, he corrects it. He doesn't tell you he's corrected it. He corrects it. Now, you want the full story, you need to read the section on resurrection in a book entitled Events Subsequent to the Return of Christ, whose author is unknown. It's all there, okay? This is the story. Of 1 Corinthians 15. Seed body, death, naked kernel, under the ground. Sprout body, springs forth, still mortal. Judgment seat, then glorification, full head of the corn. That's the stages. Now come to Daniel chapter 10, we're going to see it all again. I reckon this is one of the most wonderful sections in the Bible. What could God do more for a man, a faithful man like Daniel, in his 90s, than put him through this very process? And that's what he does. So in Daniel chapter 10, he's just given him the vision of the man of the one. He's shown him where he's going to end up. He's going to be part of the multitudinous Christ. Yeah, terrific. He says, this is how you're going to get there. This is how you're going to get there. Verse 8 and 9 of Daniel 10 says this, therefore I was left alone, which you usually are when you're dead, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in, in, in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I, was I in a deep sleep. The biblical language for death, isn't it? 
on my face and my face toward the ground. Now I know some people are strange and sleep on their, on their face, you know, on their front. But I find that ridiculously uncomfortable. I can't do that. So this the picture you get is a man who, who dies of a heart attack. Kaboom! Yeah. On his face. He's dead. In a figure, in a symbolic way, he's dead. He's gone through an enacted parable, Daniel. So, what happens? Well, there are three stages of Daniel's resurrection. And the first is in verses 10 and 11 and verse 15. It says in verse 10, And behold, a hand touched me like the angels will come to raise the dead, which set me upon my knees. So he's reformed. He's given life. And upon the palms of my hands. So it's just, that's sort of a, not a very uh, comfortable position. He said unto me in verse 11, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. You just imagine what it's going to be like for the faithful brothers and sisters when the angel that had responsibility for them in their life, who kept their record, goes to their graveside, raises them, and they pop out of the ground, and they come out very enfeebled, as you're going to see in a moment, very enfeebled. And he says, don't worry. You're greatly beloved. You're greatly beloved. Imagine the impact of that. You know where you're going, don't you? It says in verse 11, Understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. What's that? Anastasis. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. You know, why, why would this be the case, brethren and sisters? Why is it that when the angels raise the dead, they're going to stand trembling? Unable to speak. Look at verse 15. And when he had spoken such words, and I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. Why would that be the case? Well, think about it for a while. If Esau is raised, and he will be, if Esau is raised, this is the party animal. This is the man who could leap over high buildings, fire arrows at 300 yards, and kill deer. If he's raised... And he's given vitality. What do you think he'd do with it? He'd rush around making trouble, wouldn't he? And there's a lot more like him. So what's God going to do? Enfeeble them. They will be enfeebled. They won't be able to touch anybody until their turn comes for judgment. And that's the next stage, isn't it? Verses 16 and 17. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Or well, four. Well, so he can talk. And we are going to talk at the judgment seat, as we shall see in our studies, God willing. Sent unto me, and to him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision of my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. And goes on to speak in that sort of language. This is about the judgment process. Then you've got verses 18 and 19, where he's accepted and immortalised. And we read in verse 18, it says this. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of an Adam. And he strengthened me and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong. Yea, be strong. You'll never be stronger. Then when Christ turns to those on the right hand and says, Come, ye blessed of my Father, enter thou into the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. And in a moment, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, in the twinkling of an eye, and we'll come back to that statement later on, we shall be changed. Together. You know, I can't imagine that the multitude standing on the right who are immortalised while those on the left are still there watching, I can't imagine that, that multitude on the right will stand and say, well, that was a lovely feeling to be made into an immortal. That was terrific. I think there will be such bouncing around and joy over there. It's over. I've lost. 
that nature that dragged me down so often. There will be such joy. You know how I can say that with confidence? It says it in Malachi 4. It says in Malachi 4 that they shall go forth like calves, released from the stall. You know what the word is in the Hebrew? Gamble. Now, not the stuff you do down at the Indian casino. Not G-A-M-B-L-E. It's G-A-M-B-O-L. Gambling. Like when you let your cattle out in Canada after six months locked away in a barn. What do they do? Wander out and say, well, it's lovely out here. No. They're leaping around all over the place. That's what it's going to be like. We can be very thankful, brothers and sisters, that we know these things. And it's certain, it's absolutely certain, as Paul could say in his defence in Acts 24 and verse 15, we have hope toward God, which they themselves, the Jews, also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead both to the just and the unjust. And we have these words of our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 5. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. I have nearly three minutes to go. Let, let it never be said. <laughs>